morning, everyone. And as we gather today, we light the Christ candle, that light that shines before each and every one of us. Every Sunday it flickers here in the candle. And it is a light that symbolizes for us Jesus Christ as the light of the world. And even though we extinguish our candle, that light of the world has never been overcome by the darkness. Let us join together in our Easter choral introit, Christ is risen, yes indeed. Words are in your bulletin.
Let us all unite in our opening prayers, prayer of invocation, prayer of transformation, and words of pardon and grace. Let us pray. Holy God, you sent us Jesus as our comforter and guide. We give you thanks for the ways he cares for us. Help each of us to be empowered to join him in the many ministries that he was part of. We pray all of this in gratitude for your provision for us. Shepherding Christ, even as you lay down your life for us, we confess our unwillingness to support those in need sometimes. Too often we may be more like the one who runs away in times of trouble. Sometimes we're not bold enough to protect the powerless. But then following your example is rarely easy and certainly not comfortable. So forgive us, God. Help us to lay down our apathy and follow your example. Remind us that we belong to one another and to you. Amen. Beloved of God, receive these words of comfort. It's impossible to respond to every need in this complicated world of ours. A full, a full life of faith gives us the grace to lay down our work, take the rest we need, then refocus our energy toward the cause of the oppressed, the downtrodden, the unloved in this world. Rest in the shelter of your good shepherd, knowing you can take up the cause again with restored souls. We are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So our New Testament reading is another reading from 1 John. And this sort of echoes um, John 15. That one who, lays, loves, one who loves lays down one's life for their friends. There is no greater love than this. For it was Christ who laid down his life for us. Love must be lived out to meet the needs of others. Lived out love is greater than words. Our hearts will let us know when we've let down one another. <clears throat> but God is greater than our hearts and knows everything. God will forgive us and restore us to the work of loving one another. For the commandment that the faithful must obey is to believe in Jesus Christ and to love one another. So let us listen for words of love and wisdom in 1 John 3, 16 to 24. <clears throat> we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and we will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit that he has given us. God bless this reading for God's people today. Thanks be to God. Amen. The gospel reading is from John 10, verses 11 to 18. Jesus is the good shepherd. There's the window right there. It proves it. <laughs> the one who lays down his life for his sheep. 
A hired hand runs away when the wolf comes, but the good shepherd cares for the sheep and knows them. The good shepherd knows there are sheep not of this fold, but will bring them all together. That's alluding to the Gentile people. In John's account, no one has the power to take Jesus' life. Only Jesus has the power to give it up. And Jesus does so by laying down his life for all. So that life may be taken up again. So let us prepare ourselves to be touched by the witness of Scripture. May our hearts and minds be open to these words this day. Amen. John 10, 11, 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. In this reading is good news for God's people. May the Spirit of the living God be with us today. Amen. Shepherd's love. Loving, most gracious God, may what is said and heard be in the spirit of you, our living God. Amen. So just in case you're having some uh, holy humor withdrawal <clears throat> from last week, here's a good way to start today's sermon especially since we have lots of talk about sheep. Two television evangelists were talking. One was explaining how he was seeking to be the ideal shepherd to his television flock. There are three ways I seek to do that, he says. The other evangelist says, what three ways do you mean? Well, he said, first we find them. Every year we find new stations to carry our ministry. Then we feed them. I don't give them anything fancy. Just the plain, unvarnished word of God. But what's the third thing, said the second evangelist? Well, he answered, once we found them, once we fed them, then we fleeced them. <laughs> Some TV evangelists have become quite proficient at fleecing their flock. Some have even spent time in the hoose cow because of it. I hope you do know, and here you do, that there's nothing, nothing could be farther from the example of Jesus. He wasn't fleecing anybody. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that's the way shepherds operate. It wasn't an easy job. Because there was all sorts of enemies to the sheep. Lots of wild animals and also thieves and bandits too. Who just love to take. Uh, one, of the, one of the worst places was in the uh, Kidron Valley between Jerusalem and Jericho, where they used to drive sheep through there, and there was all sorts of people who were trying to steal the sheep while they were even driven through there, because the sheep provided lots of food, fleece, wool. So Jesus contrasts the good shepherd with a hired hand. The sheep actually belong to the shepherd. It works very hard not to lose a single one of them. The hired hand, however, really could care less. The sheep belonged to somebody else. He really didn't care. Why should he risk his life for somebody else's sheep? We've all known people who have that attitude. <laughs> churches often have hired hands in them. Churches are full of people who have to be pushed to do what they know they ought to do. But Jesus did not have to be pushed. Dying for the sins of humanity was not something he relished. He died an excruciating death. But still he did it of his own volition. He laid down his life, literally, for his sheep. 
that should really speak to us. It says, first of all, that humanity really did matter to Christ. Thus, it says that we really do matter to Christ. So in one of his most memorable parables, Jesus compares himself to a shepherd out in the wilderness. And one of his sheep has gone missing. He leaves the 99 other sheep under his care to search for that one lost sheep. And we will be singing a hymn about that this afternoon at Bessie's funeral. It was her choice. And it was in the old 1930 hymnary. <laughs> which was the very first hymnary for the United Church of Canada. During the season of Easter, which we are still in, the weeks of Easter, we think about Jesus as the Passover lamb, the sacrificial lamb, being sacrificed by God for our sake. It's a pretty significant thought. <clears throat> it's like a shepherd risking his life for a sheep, for just the one. It really doesn't make a lot of sense, but we see that from the perspective of how much we are loved by God. Sheep really aren't the most intelligent creatures in the world, that's for sure, animal kingdom. Uh, maybe we just overly romanticize them and think, you know, a nice little wee newborn lamb is pretty sweet, eh? <clears throat> so maybe we're just kind of, you know, overly romanticizing. I know my dad, I, I love, I told this story a long time ago, I think. My dad uh, was caught in a barn one day. And the, and the ram was between him and the doorway. The ram had the head down, and his dad didn't know what to do, except he saw a bucket beside there, and he grabbed the bucket, and the ram came at him, and he just jumped out of the way and put the bucket there, and the ram went right into the bucket, smashed his head against the, against the wall. It was kind of, saw stars afterwards, so to speak. So they're not, they're not extremely smart animals. In his book, The One and the Only You, Bruce Larson prints a hilarious letter from a friend who tells of having to deliver seven newborn sheep while her husband was out of town. And in her letter she says, never again can I think of the good shepherd without knowing that he must love us beyond measure if we were like sheep to him. A sheep's smelly, it's got an oily kind of dirt that lingers on anything it touches and soaks right through clothing to give a, an overall aroma long after you've come, you've come, come in. And she said, an old you that I hated with a passion since she takes advantage of every unsuspecting moment to assert her authority, had trouble having her lamb. Would you believe we had to pen her up all the while she was trying to incapacitate us and then wrestled her down, that's the way they put it, wrestled her down, it must have been a southern <laughs> writing, and sit on her head be before we could pull out the lamb. Then she was so exhausted, she didn't get back up to take care of her baby. She pretended, so I pretended to get back into the pen with her, and she was so anxious to clobber me, she said she got up with no trouble at all. And that was only one of seven that we delivered that week. Thank heaven, she said, the others were less traumatic. We all have this image of the cuddly little lamb, but adult sheep or sheep are not the most endearing of God's creatures. And the idea of a shepherd giving his life for a sheep seems kind of absurd. But Jesus is trying to say to us that this is how absurdly wonderful God's love is for us. From a logical standpoint, it seems absurd, absurd that God would love us that much. But that's the gospel. That's the good news. God really does care for us so much that Christ laid down his life for us. The second thing we need to know about the Good Shepherd is that God knows us by name. God doesn't just love humanity en masse. God loves each of us intimately. God knows our name. And according to John's Gospel, Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father. One of the most disturbing and influential books of the last century was that futuristic novel by George Orwell, 1984. So influential it was required reading in school. I don't know if it still is. 
don't think it is. And in that novel, everyone is under complete surveillance by the authorities. Watching over this totalitarian state was a dictator called Big Brother. <laughs> and we use that term to this day now, don't we? Big Brother is watching. People are constantly being reminded Big Brother is watching. Well, ever since 1984 at the bookstores, people concerned about individual privacy and freedom have looked for signs that Big Brother is becoming a reality in our society. It is true. There are more and more of our landscapes that are just observed by security cameras everywhere. Implanted GPS monitoring chips are plentiful now. Parents can have their children monitored. Locations of pets can be monitored. I guess it's also good news for women who could have their husbands tracked too if they wanted to. <laughs> Big Brother is watching. <laughs> God really does care for us. God knows us by name. And thirdly, God wants to be our partner as we seek to cope with life. Jesus compared us to sheep, and there are times that we, I guess, act like sheep. <laughs> However, that might be kind of dozy, kind of wandering around, losing track where we are, following all the others. But Jesus also called us friends, his brothers and sisters. He told us to be yoked to him. And he wants us to partner with him. He wants to partner with us as we live our lives. The comparison does relate to Jesus wanting to care for us, his sheep, and for us to know Jesus so well that we experience a shepherd's love. We all know stories of stories where were it not for God's love and care through Jesus, the Good Shepherd, people's lives would have been totally messed up or quite different than the new life that they might be experiencing now. Miracles do happen. Sometimes it seems that only God could be the one intercessing to help facilitate such a miracle. It may not happen today or even tomorrow, but we can be confident that God loves us God knows our needs, and God wants to partner with us as we deal with our lives. God in Jesus, the Good Shepherd. He knows the sheep, and the sheep know him. And we are his sheep. A God who cares about each and every one of us. And a God who walks alongside of us through our earthly life and then into our eternal life. For the truth of your word for us, for the creative ability of action from your word for us, for the ongoing spirit to breathe life into your word, we humbly thank you, God, of our words. Amen. All the hymns are from more voices today. That just happened by accident. I realized afterwards. <laughs> because of the nature of the hymns. This one's entitled Love is the Touch, and it's in number 89 in More Voices.
Jesus offers us fullness of life, protecting us and advocating for our needs. And we're invited to always consider what we will give of our time, our talents, and our treasure to join him in the work of building the beloved community in this world. We give you thanks for your ongoing offerings for our church and also to those who support our Mission and Service Fund of the United Church of Canada. And today's Mission and Service story is entitled Building and Strengthening Community Through Art. We would like to share a wonderful thank you letter we received from Bissell Centre, a mission and service partner located in Edmonton. We're sharing it with you with deep gratitude and thanks for your generosity. Please letter. Thank you to the wonderful people of the United Church of Canada. It's with gifts like yours that we're able to meet people facing poverty and homelessness where they're at. We look forward to collecting and sharing more stories with you like this one about John. John is one of the community members of the Bissell Centre and has a passion and a talent for art. In fact, he's been named Bissell's artist in residence. His work has been commissioned by Bissell to provide an authentic community-made element to our event advertising, our annual impact reports, and several donor, donor thank you gifts. <clears throat> His pieces, pieces often feature powerful imagery drawn from his indigenous heritage and always in a spirit of celebration. His art was the focal point of the event poster for Bissell's celebration of National Indigenous Peoples Day in, in 2022. Inspired by the love and support he has received, John wanted a way to give back. He designed, organized, and now facilitates a weekly art program called Good Art. In the workshops, he guides people to express themselves in a healthy way through art that means something to them. Folks are encouraged to share about the art they make at the end of each workshop as a way to build and strengthen community. Your support provided the space for this to happen, and your gifts are having a palpable impact in the lives of Edmontonians facing poverty and homelessness. Thank you very much, United Church of Canada. Now shared with gratitude for your gifts through mission and service. We give thanks for all those who support the mission and service fund of the United Church. Let us join together in our offertory for the gift of creation. <laughs> items of caring and sharing on this day. I'd like to get rid of the frog in my throat. <coughs> Some people may know, um, oh, it's private, I better not say anything, sorry. <laughs> not only do I have a funeral tomorrow, but I've got, or today I've got one, I've got two tomorrow. Pat, the week has just been nuts. <laughs> and 
said, it doesn't rain, but what it pours. <laughs> Anyhow, it's up as the wife of a minister. Let us join together in pastoral prayers, and we'll be concluding with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Living and loving God, engage us, for you are the one with whom all life has to do. So have to do with us now. Reveal unto us where we are really placing our ultimate trust. Illumine those places where, for all our professed longing for your presence, we have been avoiding you. Our vain search, whatever the cause, is hardening to our hearts. It makes us weary of living in a dry and thirsty land. So do something for us, God, something new and with us. And replace our hearts of stone with hearts of loving care. Shine in all of our hearts with that light of your true glory. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, search our hearts for our deep longings. Hear the prayers of those who have loved ones on their hearts, especially those who feel there's nothing more they can do. May they be found again by a love that empowers and upholds. May they be found by your love, your shepherd love. And God, hear the cries of those whose loved ones or themselves may be burdened by illness, by such earth-making changes, by loss of security, and hear the cries of those who are just plain weary of well-doing, no longer find much joy in life. May all these discover again what it is to be known and what it is to know one another. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Hear the prayers of those we name in our hearts. And let the cries of your beloved everywhere reach us especially from those living in conditions that are overwhelming. For God, this world is sometimes very overwhelming. So we pray for our world, we pray for all the people in those situations we turn away from, while at the same time offering our prayers of thanksgiving, for the hope, for the care, for the love of so many and the beauty of this world of ours. As we pray for the needs of this world, our people and ourselves, God, we pray for those words that you taught us to pray. As we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us join together in our closing hymn, Are You a Shepherd? It's in more voices, number 126.
Today we receive the gift of Christ's protective, unceasing love for you. Because you are beloved, may all that you do and all that you are be a reflection of that love. And may our eternal God, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you this day, now and forevermore. Amen.